Paris, one of the world's great cities. It's a dense and bustling metropolis, and while most people come here for the culture and food, I was here for a different reason. Hidden beneath the city streets is an enormous subterranean labyrinth of limestone quarries, which quickly became the world's largest ossuary, with the remains of over six million Parisians. But I didn't just want to explore the known sections of these catacombs, and after months of research and planning, I finally reached the uncharted and inaccessible sections of a forgotten ossuary that only a small group of extreme cataphiles had visited. This is the hidden underworld of Paris. Secrets of the Forbidden Catacombs. There are two ways to visit the catacombs. Public tours can be taken by anyone and provide tourists with a carefully curated view of clean, nicely arranged bones in maintained sections of the ossuary with lit passages, dry floors and tall ceilings. The first public visits to this section started after the French Revolution and to this day, 1.5 kilometers is open for visits. But the way we'll be taking is the exact opposite. It's illegal with flooded passages, muddy floors, low ceilings, dangerous pitfalls, and complete darkness. But it provides around 300 kilometers to explore and is the authentic version of this hidden underworld. On this first journey, I was joined by Anton and a local cataphile who would help us to navigate the complex maze of tunnels beneath the city. And while Anton and I tried to blend in, it wasn't fooling anyone. <laughs> Not in the water yet, but <laughs> it's too, too close, you know? There are many incredible rooms that have been carved out and decorated by cataphiles throughout the quarries. But our goal was to explore the forgotten ossuaries. We powered through kilometers of passages, encountering many interesting sites along the way, from wells of crystal clear water to communication repeaters and old cable conduits. We were deliberately exploring midweek to avoid encountering others. But it's not a problem, except the Yes, that's right, even down here. There is a small but specialist unit that patrols the quarries of Paris, affectionately referred to as catacops. They hunt the miles of tunnels, looking for cataphiles and illegal explorers, issuing fines to those unlucky enough to encounter them. To avoid them, we stuck to the more difficult flooded passages. The temperatures in the catacombs averages around 14 degrees Celsius, and it can be extremely humid. And as for the water, well, it was really, really cold. How is it cold? <laughs> no, it's, it's here. No, how? <laughs> You could still see the chip marks left by the miners' pickaxes in the tunnels. Limestone was a precious resource, and mining began during the first century under the Romans, with the first documented underground mining starting in the 13th century. As the Parisian miners exhausted the resources, quarries were soon abandoned and forgotten. All the while, the city's population expanded outwards and new buildings were constructed above these uncharted and unregulated mines. It didn't take long for cracks to form, leading to collapses and sinkholes. The weight of the stone in the buildings above was ironically sinking back into the ground. The city had been undermined. A massive collapse in 1774 near Montparnasse led to the permanent closure of all city mines and the formation of the Inspection Générale des Quarries under King Louis XVI. They mapped and inspected numerous quarries and erected support pillars and walls to stabilize galleries and dug interconnecting tunnels under major roads and major buildings in order to inspect and reinforce galleries with stone blocks and fill. Meanwhile, another crisis had been festering in the oldest and largest cemetery of Paris, Saint-Zinnocent. With increasing deaths from pandemics like the bubonic plague and limited space within city churches, cemeteries were overflowing and people were being buried together in large pits that could hold 1,500 bodies at a time. And it didn't take long before they started exhuming the bones after the bodies had decomposed. 
The bones were then stored in Chanel houses, built along the cemetery walls to relieve the overcrowding. The stench and health hazard from decomposing bodies was unbearable for local merchants, and during a long wet season, the weight of the bodies finally caused the destruction of a nearby basement wall. After six centuries of operation, the cemetery closed by royal decree in 1780, and a few years later the bones were exhumed and transported in nightly processions to the newly renovated quarries near Montparnasse, and emptied into mine wells, where they were spread by quarrymen into the surrounding passages of what would become the Ossuaire Municipal, the catacombs. The only trace of the cemetery that survives to this day is Fontaine des Innocents. Over the next 30 years, bones from more than 150 Parisian cemeteries were relocated to the catacombs, with over 6 million people being transferred to their new final resting place. After an hour of walking, we finally reached the ossuary beneath Montparnasse Cemetery. It was inevitable that we would have to walk and crawl over bones to fully explore the catacombs at some points. And despite our best efforts to tread carefully, it still felt disrespectful to those we were disturbing. You might think that the ground here is rock, but it's actually compacted bone dust, caused by decades of cataphiles and explorers. The ground sounds hollow and is spongy to walk on. It brings a new perspective to from dust you are, to dust you shall return. We soon arrived at a narrow crawl space, and I wasn't prepared for what I was about to see. weighing several tons were precariously jammed above our heads in what was easily the most surreal thing I had ever seen. You're kidding. <laughs> so how is it, Anton? Huh? How is it? It's so creepy, but so cool. <laughs> yeah. It's just cool to see that, but not be here. I don't understand if I touch something that can be just falling down. That is a lot. Yeah. A lot of bones. Amazing. This was one of several bone wells which was used to deliver bones into the ossuary. These were likely the last bones to be exhumed and it was easier to just seal the well and leave them inside instead of spreading them out in the passages. was the popular bone throne. Sadly, it had been destroyed several weeks prior to our visit, and we wanted to see the damage. Incredibly, cataphiles had already attempted to rebuild it, although the original was more impressive. Yeah, it's, it's not full, but it's still comfortable. As our exploration was coming to an end, it was time to make our exit via one of the few remaining well shafts. The smell in this section of the tunnel was rank. It smelt like sewage, and the colour wasn't comforting either. We had found ourselves in the most disgusting floor is lava game, and I was paying the price for choosing to wear sneakers. Oh. Oh. 
As we climbed up the 30 meter shaft and approached the surface, there was a problem. There's a car. <laughs> On top. Yes. <laughs> On top of the grave. Yes. So we can't go. No. We gotta go down. Another way to go out? Yeah, 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 there's another way. I know some way. But we need to, to walk. And so we had to play the game all over again. This is just the reality of the catacombs. Anything can change, and you have to be prepared for that. You might be wondering if the catacombs smell horrible. Well, they don't. The tunnels in general were clean, and besides the larger party rooms where tobacco and weed linger, it smells earthy and dusty, like clay and stone. The cataphiles take pride in preserving and protecting the catacombs. Yeah, so bad. So bad. It was so easy coming in. A few months later, I returned to Paris to solo explore some of the uncharted lower level passages that won't be found on normal maps. Spending seven hours in this place put me on edge, and incredibly, I didn't encounter anyone on this visit. But that is why it's dangerous. Any kind of emergency down here can be fatal. There's no phone reception, and even then, rescue could be hours away. found after squeezing through a tight passage was incredible, but this was only the warm-up. The real challenge awaited. I had been searching for a very special location for months now, searching archives and quarry maps. It was an isolated and hidden ossuary that could only be accessed by ropes, and so at midnight I met up with a friend to tackle this mission. After rigging ropes in complete darkness and silence, it was time to open the manhole and reveal the challenge ahead. Ladders are regularly removed from access shafts in order to block access to what lies below, and there was a good reason to protect this one. descent was the easy bit, and soon I got my first glimpse of what I had spent months planning for. This well-preserved ossuary had only been visited by a small number of dedicated cataphiles, and its location is something tightly guarded and protected. This isn't a place for outsiders to visit, and I was fortunate to have the opportunity to experience it myself. Inside were intact skulls, many with teeth, they filled the walls, but the centerpiece were the two wheelbarrows. They were used by quarry workers to ferry bones from the shaft into their final resting places. After a few hours taking photos, it was time for the ascent back to the surface before dawn. Ascending ropes in a confined space was a new and challenging experience, with little room to manoeuvre, and I was hauling 10 kilograms of camera equipment beneath me. both made it out and quickly escaped without a trace into the night. Having the privilege to see this incredible underworld through the eyes of a cataphile was an honour. But it also reminded me of the fragility of life and the short time that we spend on this earth. Each of these bones represented a person who lived, worked 
and was loved by others. Death, after all, is just another chapter in the ongoing circle of life.